Hello again, I'm Cody Rodemaker, curator here at the Holocaust Museum and Cohen Education Center in Naples, Florida, uh, bringing you another video connected to our exhibition, Through Their Eyes, Liberation of Concentration Camps. This was made uh, in uh, connection to our commemoration of the 75th anniversary of the Liberation of Concentration Camps. Our last video talked about Dachau Concentration Camp, and today we're going to talk about two distinct sections starting here with the Mauthausen Camp Network. The Mauthausen Camp Network uh, originated in Austria in 1938 after the Anschluss, this was the joining of Austria and Nazi Germany, so it was after their annexation, so only a couple months after that occurred, and it actually was based out of a stone quarry. They actually had the prisoners there working with hand tools to hew out uh, blocks of stone, and from there they would actually carry them on their backs up numerous steps, so very dangerous, very laborious, and uh, with very little regard to the prisoner's life and safety. And from there, Mauthausen became a network of over 50 camps, and most of those camps ended up supporting wartime industries such as munitions production, aircraft production, weapons production, etc. Now, as the Nazis lost territory, they ended up moving a lot of people back into Germany and Austria from concentration camps set up outside the, uh, their territorial bounds. And Mauthausen ended up receiving an influx of those people from these, what became known as death marches. So they were actually re receiving people, numerous, numerous numbers of people from these other camps and from their own networks as they were forced to move people into Austria. Uh, and you would think with all these influxes, people would, you know, they would change their policies, change their goals, their planning, but they really didn't. I mean, things didn't really slow down, for lack of better terms, until April 28th, when you see the, uh, the officials in the camp actually stop the killings that they were actively working towards. And the Nazi officials actually abandoned the camp in May 3rd, where they actually handed over control to Austrian firefighters, of all things. And then two days later after that, the United States actually had their army move through the area, and the 11th Armored Division is considered the liberating division of the main camp of Mauthausen. All right, so let's actually take a look at what's in the cases themselves. So what we have here is in the first case for the Mauthausen section is actually the Judy Sacker collection. So these are actually photos from the collection. There was numerous other pieces, but we wanted to highlight specifically the photos because they show what liberators saw. They saw the conditions in the camp and the overall state of the people in the camp as well. So if you look on that right side there, you'll actually see the overcrowding, the malnutrition, the undernourishment, as well as you know, like even the lack of basic clothing and, and the works there, honestly. Yeah, it's really a powerful sight to see, and I can only imagine seeing it in person. And then on the left side here is actually the exterior of the camp, including the main gate. And that main gate, it was always an interesting one because I was researching more and more, and then I looked at the actual writing on the banner above the, above the gate, and... I found out it was in Spanish. So I sat there thinking to myself, how on earth did uh, a Spanish banner end up at an Austrian concentration camp? And uh, research ended up finding a very interesting story. After the Spanish Civil War ended, anti-fascist uh, refugees actually fled to France over the Spanish border. And when the Nazis took control of France and created the puppet state in Vichy, the Vichy government rounded them up, uh, sent them to the Nazis, and then they eventually ended up in Mauthausen. So you have these anti-fascist refugees being transferred to one of the oldest Austrian concentration camps. It's very strange, but it was amazing to actually sort of dig into the story and learn more about it. So that's the main camp of Mauthausen. So let's actually talk about one of those 50 plus subcamps. We actually have some materials from local liberator, Joseph Donovan. He actually helped liberate 
Edensee. So that was done by the 80th Infantry Division. And sort of like with Malthouse, we have some interior and exterior viewing of the camp itself. In this case, we see the main gate there. And then we see what was being done after uh, the initial liberation, which from what we can tell, looks like it was um, bathing, sanitizing, things like that to help uh, prevent communicable diseases like typhus and the spread of things like body lice from these poorly treated prisoners, not only amongst themselves, but also to like allied soldiers, doctors, things like that. So it was a sanitation effort by the allies that probably saved a lot of lives because illnesses like typhus uh, were absolutely wretched and led to a lot of deaths within the concentration camp system. So it was super important that they actually started doing this as soon as possible for those who were able-bodied. So let's actually take a look at our next section now. This is actually going to be on a unique one within our uh, collections. It's actually a subcamp called Woblin. Woblin was a subcamp in the Nuengam, Nuengam system and it was actually set up to house prisoners that were transferred from other camps. So this was actually established in 1945, February of 1945. That's, you know, weeks after the liberation of Auschwitz. That's sort of mind boggling, isn't it? And this camp was actually liberated by two divisions, the 8th Army, that's like the 8th Infantry, and the 82nd Airborne. So let's take a look at some of the materials we have connected to those liberating divisions. So first one here is the Golden Arrow newspaper, and this was actually the 8th Infantry's um, newspaper. So they actually had their own newspaper, a lot of divisions did. So this is a, sort of acted like a, just a general information piece for the division itself on top of what they were getting from like the European version of the Stars and Stripes, things like that. So there's actually editions of it that covered the liberation of Woblin. So we're really, we're really appreciative that Brian Connell uh, had a copy that he donated to us so we could share that little story with you. So let's look at the, uh, the 82nd now. We actually have two really distinct pieces from the 82nd. Two of my favorite pieces that were actually displaying as part of this exhibit. First one is from the Collier County Museum collection, and it's actually a wonderful piece that was really revelatory in a couple ways, because it showed not only that there were additional liberators in our area, but also sort of allowed us to tell the story of like, that museums work together and try to find the best homes for items. So how we ended up acquiring this piece is they looked at their own collections, realized it didn't really fit in with what their goals were, and then reached out to us. We did some research, we decided that it did fit within our collecting goals, and took it in. And because of that, I get to talk to you about its original owner, Joseph Klinkovitz. Uh, Mr. Klinkovitz actually took part in four combat jumps during his time with the 82nd, and then became a liberator. So absolutely fascinating that we were able to get a little extra information about liberators in our area thanks to this one piece. And let's talk about the last big piece we're going to talk about uh, related to Woblin. It's actually from the Arthur David collection here. Now Arthur David's father, Lothar, has his own amazing story. Lothar was a young Jewish man who escaped with his parents from Europe as the Nazis were gaining power and establishing themselves. He later would be part of the army, uh, served in the 82nd Airborne, the All-American Division, and uh, actually became a U.S. citizen during his service and helped liberate a concentration camp. And one of the items he picked up along the way was actually this yellow star. Now, if you're not familiar with the yellow star, it was worn by Jews in various countries to identify them in public as Jews. This was required by the Nazis and the Nazi sympathetic governments. So I can only imagine as a Jewish man, a Jewish liberator, how powerful it was to find an item like this and 
think to yourself, that could have been my family, that could have been me. So I can only imagine how powerful it was actually holding on to this item for, uh, for as long as he did. And we're really appreciative to Arthur and Lothar for uh, giving us this incredible piece. And there you have it, folks. That is our two sections for today. Uh, do stay tuned. We are going to have at least a couple more videos coming. So stay tuned. And when you can come to the museum, we hope that you have a chance to look at the exhibit. Take care now.